right. Well, welcome to another episode of the Rest and Recovery Podcast. With me is Dr. Jeffrey Gross. He's a board certified fellowship trained neurosurgeon. Dr. Gross is also the owner of Spine and a regenerative medicine practice called We Celebrate uh, and seeing patients in California and Nevada. So uh, welcome, Dr. Jeff. We appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. I'm happy to be here and it's good to meet you and your audience. Yeah, uh, we had an opportunity, the kind of ships passing in, in, in the night, so to speak, at uh, in Austin a, about a month ago now um, at the Biohacking Congress event, but had a chance to chat briefly and, and, and great to have you here to talk further about, you know, your past with, with spine injuries and, and the evolution um, and expansion of your practice really uh, to recelebrate. So, um, you know, maybe with that, start with uh, what I call the Genesis 1-1, you know, your background with spine and, and as a neurosurgeon, um, you know, that, that background and, and the evolution portion. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's kind of a, a fun story, really. Uh, I, I'm going to take you back to my undergraduate days. I have a, 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 a degree in, in biochemistry and I really love that stuff. I'm sort of a nerd about it and how our cells function and the molecular biology of what's going on. And, and um, you know, I got I, I went right into med school and residency and fellowship training for this for spine surgery and and then into practice. And after a number of years, I looked back and said, wow, you know, that that stuff that drove me academically in college, I, I kind of missed that. Like our cells are cool. And for over 20 years of practicing neurosurgery and specifically a lot of spinal neurosurgery uh, and not just surgery, but taking care of neck and back problems with mostly non-surgical means, um, mm -hmm. I, I sort of I sort of watched this whole stem cell biology grow up in yeah. the lab. Uh, you know, I spent some time uh, doing some research in uh, lasers at the Beckman Laser Institute and right across the the street uh they they built this uh stem cell clinic you know uh not just clinic rather but uh research institute and so much was going on but not being translated into the doctor being able to deliver mm -hmm. so i got i got even further frustrated because you know as a surgeon i keep going to my annual annual meetings you know we go to the conferences we get our continuing education hours not a lot has changed right i mean we're we're still doing the same kind of surgeries with some slight improvements along the way or a new, you know, bell and whistle on a, on a screw and rod or something, but patients come in and it's a modern world and we catch problems earlier. We catch them at a lower level, you okay. know, instead of waiting for someone to be bedridden, we have patients with nagging back pain or neck problems or what have you. They don't want surgery. And I, 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 you know, I, I said, well, you know, if, if the, if the therapy didn't work and the medicines didn't work, and the maybe some injections didn't work, you know, I mean, we we're really, you're in that big void of, well, yeah, you're not quite ready or bad enough for surgery, but this is really getting at you. And that's where I think out of frustration, I said, uh, I, and, and watching the science happen and read about it, I went back and I retrained and I, I read and I learned and, um, there are applications of regenerative medicine, of stem cell medicine to help people. And I'm applying that not now, not only to my chosen field of spinal neurosurgery, right. but other things that I never thought I would be doing. So I'm treating all kinds of, of, of different things. Well, that's a great overview. And I think the, the thing I liked the, what you said was um, being a continued learner in that not, and, and going back to the, the basics, so to speak, or the foundations that we kind of have to, no matter where we are in our life, to go back to that because kind of like watching a movie, you you see a scene differently when you watch it like the second or third time, right? You don't, you miss the joke or whatever. And, you know, plus you have the tenure of, of life and having experience and then you re see it through a different lens. That, that's totally fair. Yeah. Anyway, I, I could say it's, it's way more rewarding and fun now. And I have something to offer in addition to the traditional stuff. Yeah. And make it better in some ways than some of the traditional things that some of my colleagues yet haven't adopted. So I, I like to be that second opinion or, hey, let's try one more thing before you have surgery. 
you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great point. Cause I mean, you know, I've had some systemic back challenges myself, but you know, you're, like you said, there's, there's a lot of people, how big of an audience would you say that uh, let's say audience, but like demographic of people kind of in that messy middle that impairs life, right? It's, it's degrades their, their quality of life um, challenges. Well, uh, let's, let's just take low back pain. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's a very big disability driver in the country, meaning many people miss work or affects their life in some form. Uh, like you said, I mean, I've had an injury. I've, I have some, depending on how long I stand, you know, you said you've had some, I think most people either have had some episode. Uh, I think there's some statistic over 80, 80% of people at some time in their life will have an episode of, of back, low back pain. Um, uh, there's another very large chunk that have ongoing recurring or, you know, episodic or, or chronic, you know, nagging low back problems. And I'm just picking low back, you know, we didn't yeah. even, yeah. so I would say there's, a, there's a very large absolute and relative, uh, portion of society that has an issue. Then on top of that, the vast majority don't want surgery. Yeah. Uh, I went back and looked statistically at my own practice and found that less than 5% of my encounters with people were surgical. So that means 95% were non-surgical. Oh, so wow. that means there's a large portion of people who have not had surgery, but have some issue. So what, uh, let me start, you know, foundationally, what are some of the root causes, I'll say, uh, to some of those systemic things? Is there a, a, a cluster of reasons for that? relative to lifestyle uh it, low back pain specifically yeah let's just stick with that topic yeah i think that's that's a good topic we could the other ones might parallel it but low back mm -hmm. pain is more ubiquitous yeah i mean listen we we walk on two legs and that stresses the low back the low back is sort of the uh it's a weight transfer from your spine to two legs and uh, there's a lot going on in terms of that stress at the lower back, at particularly the lowest level of the low back. Um, plus, we we lift and we bend. Uh, we we don't train our cores and low back uh, part of the core. I want to make sure the core is all the way around us, not just the front um, properly. Um, I mean, some do. Don't get me wrong, but uh, as a society, we're sitting. Um, and we have a poor muscle tone in that area. So we're not supporting our own selves. So we are prone to injury. Um, we live longer. Uh, you know, part of my regenerative practice has accidentally fell into the anti-aging realm. Okay. Because what we do in regenerative medicine is, is combat inflammatory and degenerative cellular activity, which as it turns out is really combating the age process. So we live longer, and if we live longer, we have more time to degenerate. That's like, uh, you know, you're driving a, a 1967 Plymouth. You know, it's yeah. 23. It's going to have some issues, right? It's yeah. Gonna, yeah. Uh, but when you have it. It takes more maintenance. So, so we accumulate these things. That that's probably the over overview of the epidemiology of this. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, to the point of longevity, we have expanded lifespan. Uh, but you're hearing a lot around, and I think where regenerative medicine comes into play is probably on the health span aspect of it is like, we're living much longer, but it's almost like we're stretching the bandaid out further, which makes it thinner. You know what I mean? Perfect. Yeah. I mean, it, we have to fill our lifespan with healthy time, which is health span, right? So right. we want health span to fill most of our lifespan and that takes work, it takes effort. It takes, uh, strategies. It takes hacking, biohacking. That's where we get there. <laughs> So maybe let's unpack that or, or, you know, what was your, you know, as you dug into the, the cell aspect, you explained at a high level, you know, what were some of the things that you saw at, to be promising um, and, and really for you to launch, you, you know, recelebrate? Um, well, I, I noticed uh, some interesting things. I, it's, it starts with, if you look at other species like salamanders, axolotls, starfish, uh, they can regrow limbs or tails. And then I read a paper um, that children, human children under the age of five to six, if you cut off just the tip of the finger, not that you would do this as a test, but kids sometimes get into trouble and, sure. and lose, uh, you know, hurt themselves. 
So, uh, you know, uh, and you cut it off after or further out, or what we say in doctor speak is distal to uh, the last joint of the finger. If they're under that age, they will regrow that fingertip. Um, this oh, is wow. no. Yeah, we lose that ability. So what's going on? We have the same genes at age five than we do at age eight. So why does that change? Then a couple other things occur to me. Um, so so first, if you look at a if if you have young children in your life, or you know whether your own children or nieces and nephews or anybody, if you you're outside playing, they skin their knee on the sidewalk. You know, you clean it off bandage it, kiss it, send them on their way, right? Three right. days later, the mandate falls off and the scab is almost completely healed, right? right. Whereas you, you look at your grandmother, she bumps her elbow and, you know, three weeks later, there's still bruising and discoloration and modeling of the skin. Why, what happened? Why can't that, why can't we heal like that three-year-old? It's the same genes, right? Um, and, and then the last thing that finally got me was um, and during my residency, it became uh, interesting to operate on fetuses who are found on ultrasound to have what's called spina bifida. It means part of their spina didn't close right. Okay. And those kids can have troubles, but if you close it up, the earlier you close it, the more likely they'll develop better functions and not have as many troubles. So there was this fetoscopic surgery where uh, certain surgeons would, would go through the uterus to the fetus, oh, wow. close it up, and then let the fetus come to term and then deliver the baby, uh, usually by C-section. And some of those babies would come out with barely, if any, scarring from that surgery. So what's so magic about the amniotic fluid? What's yeah. so magic about the more youthful you are, the more regenerative capacity you have? So that all kind of came together in my in my head. And I, I say, okay, there's something really great about the youthful growth factors and proteins and PRP was coming up around this time. And, and, and there was something special about concentrating these growth factors. So I did all my homework and, and that's where I figured out that um, there, there is growth potential from the proteins and the signaling messenger uh, vesicles called exosomes coming from stem cells, coming from amniotic fluid. And the doctors that were using these um, and the papers coming out of China and Europe where they didn't have as many restraints were amazing. I mean, we have a study from France that's over 15 year follow up in uh, taking people who are bone on bone on their knee, needing a joint replacement and saving them from needing a joint replacement using in that study, wow. uh, harvest, harvested stem cells. Um, so uh, 15 years later, about just over 80% of those of those patients still did not need a knee replacement. So there, there's something that we're slow to adopt here. And uh, maybe maybe I carry the banner for let's let's move this thing along quicker if we can. Yeah, well, that certainly sounds pretty phenomenal in in what's been able to be accomplished that, you know, not at scale yet, but, you know, in, in certain aspects of life. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, I love, I'm so <clears throat> excited by the science and bringing it, translating it, they call it translation, right? Bringing this to the clinic as, as much as possible uh, th that we can, because we can help things without surgery. And you know what? Surgery, it, it's still pretty barbaric what we have to do sometimes, you know, screws and rods in your back and, you know, it doesn't cure all the pain. Um, yeah. You know, it used to be reserved for people who could barely get out of bed. And now the problem is, uh, you have a little bit of back pain, some findings on MRI, you fail other treatments, and that's what they offer you. And, uh, I, I don't want to offer that to people until they have to have it, you know? Yeah, and there's other, you know, I guess, aspects to that, too, is, you know, you're, you're cutting the fashion or whatever is happening there, and that, that whole process and, you know, um, the, the even the trauma just emotionally associated with some of that stuff too can be can be uh negatively impacting depending on how you recover uh a hundred percent and not only the the stress of it and and the tissue damage but the cost i mean the cost of a of a let's call it low back fusion surgery is many times the cost of some of the regenerative type injections and things that we can do yeah so what are the mechanisms um, to facilitate that? Is it shots? Is it 
you know, yeah, how, what are the mechanisms to, to kind of help facilitate that? Uh, this is where I like to bring in the phrase precision medicine. Um, everyone's different. We, we, when we, when I first meet someone, uh, usually, you know, people travel to see us. So it's usually someone, uh, uh, not in my, uh, general vicinity. So we get on the, on the zoom call and we break it down we find out exactly what's bothering them, you know, point, start with this, you know, first day of medical school, where does it hurt? Point to it. Let's start there. Okay. What tests have you had? Where, what triggers it? What makes it feel better? Let's really get to know it. Um, and then we usually, it, it, if it's a spine we're talking about, uh, we do want to get a high quality MRI and not all MRIs are the same. You know, there's, uh, there's Walmart quality all the way through Nordstrom quality. And, and, and this has to do with the resolution and the sequences and what we're looking at. Um, and then we, we try to correlate at the end of the day uh, is what we see on the MRI matching with the pain. If we can find precision targets, uh, then we might be able to do some injections into those targets. Okay. So that's that's kind of the overall approach. Okay. And then what are the you mentioned a couple different things, just what what are, what are, what's being used to help that? Is it coming from my own body and using my own stem cells or what are the my own opinion uh, on this, and this is the, uh, uh, you know, 30,000 foot view is there are multiple sources of, we'll call them biologics, uh, stem cells. Um, well, the, the easiest, the simplest thing would be PRP, right? We can harvest that from your blood, spin it down and concentrate growth factors. Okay. There's probably a few stem cells in there and there's probably some exosomes, which I'll circle back to in a moment. Um, and that can help. Usually you need multiple um, treatments of that. One is not enough. And that's harvested from you. Um, the, the next step up would be stem cells and stem cells can come from one of two sources. And you, you already alluded to Scott, they can come from you. We could take them out of your bone marrow or fat. Now I don't like the fat source because fat tissue, even, even if you're not obese, fat tissue is inflammatory generally. Uh, it's inflamed, and I don't want to put an inflamed message back into your body. Okay. I want the opposite message. I want an anti-inflammatory, because your cells sort of have two main programming modes. They're inflamed, degenerating, aging, and making proteins to protect themselves, or they're in a youthful, regenerative, restorative mode, which is anti-inflammatory. So I want to focus on that anti-inflammatory. I'm certainly not going to get that mode optimize if I'm using inflamed fat source tissue. Now, okay. there are lots of studies that show fat source uh, stem cells do have some benefits and they do, um, but I think we can do better. Um, so the, the other main source is from your bone marrow, um, probably your best source, right? That's the that's where your life force comes from. And um, the, um, the, the harvest is painful. Hmm. Now I'm 57. Uh, when you pull out my stem cells, they are also 57. So putting uh, my sleepy stem cells that don't work like they did when I was three to heal my scab doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Sure. Now with PRP, you you concentrate it down and you get a like a concentrated dose where you need it. So that probably is in play because harvested stem cells from us. Uh, and I just I just dragged you into my age group. Do you like that? Uh, harvested stem cells from us, uh, they do have benefit. But the best source takes me back to the amniotic source. So my favorite source of stem cells or exosomes, which I'll circle back in one second, um, are what we call perinatal sources. These come from amniotic fluid, umbilical cord, uh, uh, it's called Wharton's jelly. It's the fluid that comes from there, placental tissue, and these are, are come from clean labs, FDA approved labs in, in this country. Uh, and they are concentrated and tested and screened. And that's what I think is the best, most youthful source. And in there are the more youthful cells that act like you're in the amniotic fluid, right? They're the youngest stuff we can get. Okay, okay. That's my favorite source. That's what I use. It's, it, I don't have to harvest anything. I can, I can get this. It's, it's easy to obtain and deliver. It's not, it's not inexpensive, but it, if it, in the long run, it probably is compared to what it does. Yeah. And then, and, and then if I could, 
I'm sorry, I didn't mean to like take over the whole conversation. No, exosomes are, are sort of the, the next step, right? So it turns out this the cells communicate with their neighbors through small, um, I'll call them particles, but it's really a little bit of membrane, growth factors, RNA. Uh, and, and what happens is one cell, let's say, is under threat, infection. It sends out warning to the neighbors to sound the alarm, to, to influence the programming of that cell. Remember, whether it's inflammatory or restorative or anti-inflammatory. So, so these little particles, are they're, they're about one one thousandth the size of a cell. Um, and each cell can give off thousands of them. They're called extracellular vesicles. Extracellular mean, meaning out of the cell, given off. Vesicle means a, a little uh, membrane. It's almost like a mini cell. Um, so we can now use these exosomes for short mm -hmm. uh, from the amniotic fluid source, highly concentrated, um, and give a dose that's perhaps superior to a stem cell dose because of the concentration. Wow. The other beauty of exosomes is if someone is dealing with a problem of the nervous system, exosomes are small enough to pass across the membrane called the blood-brain barrier. That And that's a protect, you know, the brain and spinal cord are protected in addition to being protected in our body through this membrane. Exosomes are small enough to pass through that filter. Uh, stem cells are not. So I've been a bigger fan of exosomes being a very efficient delivery of, of a signal to tell your cells and your own stem cells to wake up and act like they used to when they were three. That's pretty incredible. So let me ask you this. So with the stem cells and the exosomes, can you mention nerves? Can, can the stem cells help regenerate nerve endings and things of that nature or... So scientifically, yes, um, there is, we're now known, and when I trained, we, we didn't think so. We thought the brain, you know, once you lose brain, you, you're done, right? You, yeah. that, that those cells don't grow. There is something called plasticity where other cells might take up the function or have to relearn, you know, you watch enough movies about, you know, injuries and you, you know, people have to relearn how to walk. Well, it turns out there is, there is regeneration within the nervous system. Uh, we are now seeing that. Um, and, and I think we're going to continue to learn more about that through regenerative medicine, um, through different types of different types of cells. The nervous system is made up of nerve tissue type cells and supporting type cells. So the typical stem cells and exosomes that we use are called mesenchymal. Uh, and that means they come from sort of the connective tissues of the body, which is why they're great for bones and joints and muscles and ligaments and things like that, okay. uh, and other organs and things. But the nervous tissue may require uh, nerve-based stem cells or neural tissue stem cells or neural tissue exosomes, and that's currently not available to me yet or okay. anyone but outside of a lab. So that's being explored and trying to, that would be like, because you see the rise of a lot of chronic diseases and it seems there's a, a big correlation to the, the neurological aspect of things. And you mentioned the blood brain barrier and, and that connection to, to the brain and the nervous system. Right. And I, I might want to mention here that, that many of the neurodegenerative problems like uh, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease have inflammatory components and Aside from regenerative medicine being very anti-inflammatory, there are many other lifestyle and supplement and diet uh, behaviors that can help slow and stop inflammatory processes. So we are now learning a lot about the benefits, for example, of probiotics and how your gut bacteria make certain uh, small biochemicals that, that communicate with the nervous system and have an influence on uh, the inflammation or reduced inflammation in brain. And, and there are if, you know, wonderful studies about uh, use of certain kinds of probiotics and depending on their makeup and their mix and uh, helping to reduce the incidence uh, and the progression of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, uh, other neurologic problems. Most of the degenerative oh. diseases of the body are inflammatory diseases but, and vice versa. Anything inflammatory degenerates more rapidly. Think about a joint. If you have an old joint injury, you have, you develop what's called osteoarthritis and itis means inflammation. Okay. 
thinking out of a word like tonsillitis is inflamed tonsils. So mm-hmm. anything we can do that's anti-inflammatory uh, will help slow that process. So you see a lot of people working on slowing aging. You know, there's a lot in the news now on this. Yeah. And yeah. Most of those techniques, most of the uh, uh, things they do are, in fact, anti-inflammatory techniques. That's pretty incredible. And yeah, I've been hearing a lot about that. And, you know, I even saw a post where somebody was was making the anti-anti-aging argument um, in, in that, you know, it's hyperbole and all this stuff and in you know i guess it depends on where it is in the spectrum of understanding right it sounds like we're very early on so you know you want that entrepreneurial aspect within science always right it's a it's a foundational skill i think that that's what has been driving uh medical or biotechnology uh along the way i think without without that drive uh, and maybe I'll get on my soapbox for a minute here because because a lot of health insurance scripts healthcare or what they'll pay for. Yeah. And a lot of doctors sort of have no choice but to but to follow that. And it's kind of the tail wagging the dog. So because these third party insurers are sucking the money out of the system, we can't deliver the highest quality care that we used to. And I say we, but I I I I continue to fight that on a regular basis. But well, it's a um, macro problem, right? a huge problem and until the conflict of interest is pulled out by that that is manifest in the in the third party insurers the private insurers where they should be more like a public utility they, they can make it like a 10 percent margin and that's it because the problem is you've got ceos of these companies making 100 million dollar bonus and i can't get an mri for my my poor patient approved until they she has three quarters own shots or something and i they're telling us how to practice if we want to get it paid for. So, yeah. um, you know, I, why did I go to school for all those years? They could have just uh, sent me the cookbook. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> could. Find that. Anyway, that, that was obviously me being a, a bit a snarky, but um, there's a problem. And uh, that's another reason why I'm, I'm working. I'm trying to help people uh, have options that aren't driven by some insurer or payor. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I keep hearing this consistently just had just a, my recent episode 127 was kind of along those lines of there's a, there's a massive gap between practice and policy, um, on, yes. on, yeah, on, you know, the decision policy's making winning. <laughs> policy's winning, except, except here at recelebrate. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But it's, yeah, it's trying to bridge that divide, right. In, in getting there and, you know, things cost something. And people are providing service, so profits fine. But also, if there's a massive disconnect to your point of, you know, at the ground level, people aren't able to get some simple transactional things. There, there's a bit of a schism there. <laughs> there is a a, a a growing divide in that schism for sure. <laughs> so um, let's just stick on the you know the the anti aging and really the other term in that space is longevity. Right. I think we all would love to when we touch on the two other terms. I think that kind of center underneath that is is health span and lifespan. Um, expand a little bit on on those two terms and like how you see this evolving. Sure. So I, I um, you know, I, I've this is a corollary and a, and a necessity for getting into regenerative medicine, because um when you look at the cellular level, if we can slow that inflammatory programming, we're slowing the biological aging. And maybe we'll define that real quick. And yeah. we know what aging is or longevity is. We measure it on our calendar. You know, how many birthdays have you had? <laughs> right. But you could, you know, especially in older individuals, you can you can look at two 70 year olds and one will look very elderly and be slow and and show the effects of time and one will be robust and vital and active and 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 uh, have more energy so why those people have the same born on date you know why are they why are they so different and this is harder to see in the younger group but you know the the more time you give them to to separate the distance you can see the tortoise and the hare uh separate at the race there why is that it's it's biological It's, it's what's going on in the cells it's how how much 
accumulated inflammatory trauma those cells have experienced. So when your grandmother said, you know, eat your fruits and vegetables, you know, um, you know, get good rest, you know, hydrate, exercise. Um, she was right. And she was right. Not just because she was trained to say that as a grandmother would, but because really on the cellular level, those things are reducing inflammatory burden in the cells. So someone coined the term inflammaging yep. saying, inflammation is aging and, and, and it really is a great term. I, I'm sorry, I can't quote the author at this time, but um, that that's accurate. As we inflame, we age and as we age, we inflame and disease gets dragged with that. So accumulated inflammation uh, goes towards disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, acquired diabetes rather, um, which is called type two, uh, Alzheimer's disease. These are inflammatory diseases things start to not work at the cellular level. And it, knowing that and making the right strategic lifestyle choices and changes and hacking, um, one can gain that system to have not only more lo longevity because they have more, it's they're sl more slowly acquiring that inflammation. Yeah. But they can fill that longevity with more healthy years. So there are these biological age tests. There, there are different ones out there. And they look at markers and changes within within your cells. So, okay. because if you put a cell under the microscope, you don't know how old that cell is. You don't right. know its birthday. But we can measure through these different types of tests, and they all correlate very well uh, with each other. We can correlate how much accumulated damage that cell has, and that damage is now we have they, we have enough statistics to correlate that damage with a relative age. So people do biological age tests. And they see maybe the, you know, their lifestyle, you know, a 40 year old might be 48 in biological years. And whoa, I better make some lifestyle changes, you know, maybe not drink so much, uh, get some more exercise, get out of my chair more, <laughs> uh, eat more, you know, real, you know, food, fruits and vegetables, less processed. I mean, we, uh, you know, part of my anti-aging consultations, we go over the whole thing, supplements, whatever. So and then six months later, we can repeat that biological age test and you can see movement. You can see age reversal through biological age, not through calendar age. So um, that is the ultimate biohacking. That is helping someone fill their, increase their lifespan and their health span within it. That's incredible. So, so how the challenge I get, not challenge, but like what I was referencing earlier, I heard somebody really challenging this idea, right? That we can't measure this stuff right now it's not proven blah de, blah sounds like you just kind of contradicted that statement but um how uh new are some of these tests and understandings to to kind of assess that the tests have been around a few years um mm -hmm. but they've been accumulating data for many years so um you know a, a result is only as good as the data it's built on so sure. they have enough uh, in their cohort, you know, um, in terms of looking at people's actual age and their biological age, and they can now correlate and follow people longitudinally and, and, and reproducibly. Yeah. So, okay. So plus, um, even if it's not a hundred percent absolute, but it's a trend and it helps people make the right changes, then great. Um, and it's kind of gamifying the system, right? Like how young can you get? Right. Right. And I guess but, at the end of the day, too, like there's going to be not just the science, but the subjective, like the 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 client is going to feel better. They're going to have more energy. You know, you're going to have that. So it's going to it's going to show up in real life, not just on some test. A hundred percent. You know, the, the problem is the symptoms or how you feel take they, they're slow to notice that. Right. It, yeah. It's it's people like a good metric. Like if, if, I don't know if you've had anyone on that does, uh, you know, wearable tech or, or does like a HRV heart rate variability. I mean, yeah. I would love to, to do a, a study where we have the biological age test. We make some lifestyle changes, but we also track HRV. That would uh, be a cool overlay. That would be really, I, neat. I think it would. And if you, I do listen to some of the podcasts from 
from the HRV people and the, the statistics are amazing. You know, people can see their, oh, well, I've got to change here. I'm, I'm getting sick or, oh, uh, you know, I stayed out too late. I better go easy on my training day, whatever. You, you, we, we can tweak and biohack and continue to get better at things um, that, that, you know, traditional clinical medicine has not provided us in terms of knowledge and um, application for decades. So this is, this is kind of a boom in biotechnology. It comes from the regenerative side and um, it's just exciting. It, it's like my chapter two. I'm, I'm excited again. I'm a bit of a, ner a, bi a biochemical nerd of sorts. So this, this, uh, this soothes that part of my brain, but uh, I, I just love it. I hope others do too. Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, most people will love the result. <laughs> so all all your passion and i that's huge I, I love the fact that you're um again the continuous learning model uh to help you know the medical community and, and find better ways to do things like you started that in your career path from a surgical perspective and it, to your point not that it's irrelevant but it's maybe um uh, more tactful on how it's applied and there's other mechanisms to to help with that yeah thank you Thank you. Um, well, we're, we're, we're creeping up on time here, but w what did I miss on this regenerative space, right? There's, there's, there's so much out there in, in anti-aging regenerative medicine. Um, what, what's a key element that yeah, I, think, I think this, listen, uh, it, it's here. Uh, you don't have to go to Panama to have it done. Uh, 10 years ago, you did, you, you know, Tiger Woods and pro athletes, uh, you know, on the off season, sneak out of the country and, and have these things done. You can do them here. Now we have to be, I'll be upfront and cautious. The FDA has not yet uh, approved these procedures uh, as they approve things. Now, many things doctors do isn't necessarily approved by the FDA. So as long as you understand that these, they, the FDA calls these experimental, and we certainly give full consent on that. So, um, and most people understand that, uh, that come to talk to us anyway. Um, uh, so it doesn't fit the policy. This is back to policy. Um, certainly um, big pharma doesn't want this to happen. It'll put them out of business uh, in some ways. Uh, and it'll be a slow adoption of this in terms of you know policy and, and, and that kind of thing and payment. Mm -hmm. So insurance doesn't cover it for that for those reasons. Uh, be that as it may, it's here. Uh, we so we're very careful. We don't make any claims that we can treat or cure anything. Uh, and I'm upfront about that. Of course, doctors can't really do that anyway. <laughs> you know, we can't guarantee anything. So um, uh, I I, um, I have I have some great and I showed at the the event where we met. Um, some before and after uh, joints where we uh, were able to show improvement in the cartilage present. Oh, wow. Uh, I can't, um, you know, I can't say that one person will have the same result as that sure. example, but I have more and more of those examples. We're doing that in the spine. We're doing it in the joints. Um, we're using regenerative for other purposes uh, all the way just through anti-aging, uh, you know, energy, feel good, all the way down to individual issues, um, whether they be you know orthopedic in nature or you know other. I, I I have athletes. We do injuries, all kinds of things. Okay, awesome. So and it, again, kind of tack on what you said. This is not medical advice. Uh, would you encourage folks to explore this option if they're staring at the knife? Um, to at least get a consult along these lines with someone like yourself to ensure they've done due diligence to avoid surgery. And it's, again, not that surgery isn't a, a good tool, but it it's, seems like more like a last resort, especially mm -hmm. with the spine. I, I think surgery is a last resort unless there's some type of impending urgency or emergency or such severe pain or something. Um, but why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you get all the options that are available explained to you so that when you do make a decision to have surgery or not, you have a fully informed consent. If you weren't given these options, then you weren't fully informed because they are available. Great. Great. Well, um, Jeffrey, uh, appreciate your time. I like to close things out with a couple of, uh, personal questions. 
Sure, so nothing, nothing too too strenuous. But what are you reading right now? What am I What am I eating right now? Reading, reading. Oh, uh, so uh, right now I'm reading scientific articles every morning because I'm working on a book. Oh, uh, cool. the book is called Young Again. It is uh, probably sixty percent done. And it's a how-to guide of anti-aging all the way from sleeping, breathing, supplements, all the way through rapamycin, metformin, regenerative medicine, yeah. uh, exotic herbs, things like that. So I know I copped out of your question because I don't have a book in front of me right now. But uh, well, that's all right. Yeah, that's um, what you're reading. Research yeah. papers. All right. What are you listening to right now, be it music or podcast? So I'm a podcast guy. I'm a big fan of... Um, uh, the Whoop podcast. I hmm. listen also to, um, um, of course, her name isn't coming to me right now, but uh, shoot, can I look at my phone and give you the best yeah. answer? I want to be yeah. Absolutely. She, there's a shout out from, uh, here it is. It's Rhonda Patrick. She's oh, my, okay. she's my uh, biochemistry friend and she has excellent content. It's thorough, it's researched, and it, usually a great summary. Um, she has great, if, if you're interested in one of my favorite biochemicals is sulfur fane, and she has a great podcast on how she deals with her broccoli sprouts. So if you can take one little tidbit for biohacking away, get your fresh broccoli sprouts. So they call them microgreens at the store and uh, they're in the, they're in the like, you know, fruits and vegetables area. Yeah. What are my meals, your sandwiches, your salads? You got to chew them up to activate them, chew them good and, and they're, they're good for you. Cool. You know, we've been looking into the microgreens because you can easily grow them in your home and, and around. So uh, cool. All right. Uh, last one. What's your go-to rest and recovery method? Uh, so I'm a big fan of sleep. Um, good sleep. So cold room, um, uh, dark, um, turn off your screens well in advance, 10 good deep breath um, and uh, just just, you know, make sure you're getting your full restorative sleep and REM cycles and dreams and stuff. A, 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 real, a real quick side corollary is when I, at the end of med school and residency and early in my practice, I was taking call. And sometimes that call was two nights out of three. Uh, you know, you're on the first call, then you're the second call, then you're off. Uh, I wasn't dreaming. I didn't dream for 12 years. And I wasn't dreaming because I was either on call, so not really sleeping much, being woken up during the night. Or in that third night, just so ready to be woken up. Like it, you're, you sort of get uh, attuned to that. And at some point uh, after a number of years, I stopped taking call except for my own patients and um, stopped taking emergency room and trauma center call, really. So uh, I noticed that I was sleeping without being interrupted. And after a while, I started dreaming again. And that's the REM cycle. And that's part of the res restorative sleep. And there's, there's a, we could do a whole podcast on the waves of the brain going on and how that's yeah. important. Sleep, rest, recover. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Dr. Jeffrey, appreciate it. Thank you so much for all you're doing. And uh, 